motion um, for HIT 212. Tonight what we're going to do is begin to walk ourselves through the book. I'm going to assume that you know nothing, okay? Uh, you do know a lot then, don't you? All right. I'm going to assume you. Now, uh, our code books, as far as our Faye Brown, are going to be identical. We've all got the 2009 version. Mm -hmm. All right. I don't have a 2009 coding book, and you do. So there won't be any way that I can tell you which page to get to, but, you know, we'll, we'll be fine. That won't be a problem. All right. I want you to take a look at page Roman numeral three, right at the beginning of the book, where the contents are. Because I want you to look at what we are going to be covering. One through seven is the getting started part. You know, it's just trying to teach you what this is all about, trying to give you an idea of, of why we code and how it works. Then when we get into Chapter 8, you're really starting to go into some of the individual sections in coding. And you'll see that that goes on from Chapter 8 all the way over to Chapter 29. Each one of those is a different chapter in coding with different sets of rules and different examples and things like that. Then when you get down into chapter 30 through 34, you all are right here on the edge of when we are about to embark on ICD-10 instead of ICD-9-CM. To show you how it changes, as of Jan early January, it was going to be changed in 2011. Since early January, they've already changed their mind to back it up to 2013. Well, that's not that far away. It really isn't when you think about it. And you all are going to have to learn not only ICD-9, but when the time comes, you're going to have to learn ICD-10, you and everybody else in the country, okay? So you're not going to be alone. You're going to have lots of workshops, lots of things you're going to have to do to catch up. It, and ICD-9 will give you a good background, but it is an entirely different coding system. And we haven't changed coding systems in 30 years. Now, it was a nightmare when we changed from 8 to 9. I lived through that one, and I swore I'd retire before I'd ever go through another one, and I just might make it. <laughs> I just might make it. But it's something that we all have to do. Years ago, it was just hospitals that had to do it, and it was a nightmare. Now it's going to be hospitals, physician's office, insurance companies, home care, health agencies, anybody that uses health data. So it's going to be a major, major issue. But we're going to try to get you ready on an introductory basis to know what to expect and some things about the implementation. Then I want you to notice that there are things in here that have your reporting of your present on admission indicators, your POAs. You will grow to know them as that. Then there's some case <coughs> summary exercises. All right. Now, turn over to page Roman numeral 5. And just because we're health information people, there's two ladies that have been real relevant in our history that you need to know something about. One is Edna Huffman. She was kind of like the, uh, the writer of the, of the famous medical record management book that we all grew up on. You all have had that subsequently replaced. And the other one is Faye Brown. And when you hear Faye Brown's name, it's synonymous with the American Hospital Association and with coding, because she was the foremost expert on coding. But anyway, it tells you a little bit about the authors of the book and the central office on ICD-9. So took a look at page Roman numeral six. You need to know what the central office on ICD-9-CM is. It actually was, was created through the American Hospital Association and the National Center for Health Statistics, also known as the AHA and the NCHS. Those are real important things. And they did it so that there would be one clearinghouse, one place that would make all the rules about ICD-9-CM coding. And so the AHA is the foremost authority in this country on ICD-9-CM. Um, it is called the Central Office. They are, of course, located in the AHA, which is in Chicago. And so they will always be the authorities. All right, the next couple of pages are, are not of interest till we get to Roman numeral 9. How to use this handbook, Roman numeral 9. I want you to have read it because I think it's important. It just kind of acclimates you to the book and what's supposed to be in the book. Uh, take a look at page Roman numeral 11. We consistently have changes in coding. We always have a change in coding every October 1 because a new book comes out. 
with all its updates. But even in between that, we can have some changes. There are four cooperating parties that have been charged with the responsibility of making all the decisions dealing with coding. And that's what's listed for you on page Roman numeral 11. The American Hospital Association, or the AHA, the American Health Information Management Association, or AHIMA, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, we typically call that CMS, and the National Center for Health Statistics, or the NCHS. Now, those four parties get together and make any decision that's necessary, and that's why we call them the cooperating parties. So you need to make sure you realize that, realize their relationship to the central office, and realize that the only place that you can get up-to-date information about changes in codes is through Coding Clinic. That's that second paragraph. Coding Clinic comes out uh, quarterly, and it will give you any changes in official coding guidelines. I can promise you that any hospital you're going to work for is going to get us have a subscription to that. Physicians' offices typically don't. It's very costly, and they don't always keep up the way they should, but you're going to be needing to stay up to date with, with coding clinic. Now, I think from that you see that there's a distinct difference in coding in a doctor's office and coding in a hospital just by the support services that you have. So you'll typically find the people that are most up to date in coding are those in the hospital setting, in the inpatient hospital setting. Now, that's not to say that the outpatient coders don't know what they're doing. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that they don't have to keep up with it all like the inpatient coders do. So does that give you a little bit of an idea about why an inpatient coder may make more money than an outpatient coder? Yeah, they've got to know all of it. They don't get any breaks. Whereas the outpatient coder or the physician's office coder doesn't, well, they should, but they don't have to keep up with the magnitude in the same way. All right, questions so far?